Welcome to Time Flies. I'm Peter Hennessy, and with me is Michael Smith, ace intelligence historian and author. Michael, do you think the Brits have a special fascination for spies and spying between hardcovers? Well, I think so. I mean, the Ian Fleming books, the James Bond books, but there were books long before that, Riddle of the Sands, of course, famously in the first one. Erskine Childers, yeah. classic stuff. What was the first one that gripped you, and how old were you? Um, I think it has to be Goldfinger for some reason. Um, I can remember those um, grubby old, I think they must have been published by Pan. Yeah, um, they were. James Bond books, and, and I loved them. My parents had gone to see Goldfinger, and I was too young to go and see this sort of stuff. A bit racy for you. I was fascinated by the idea that there might be something in this book that I wasn't allowed to read about. And that's continued ever since, really, I think. Yeah. One has to be careful in this territory, but you did a bit of it yourself. You were in the trade working for the Queen in a, in a very secret capacity, weren't you? Did that help you as an author, do you think, looking back? I think it did. I mean, it certainly, when I, when I left the army, I didn't want to have anything to do with intelligence in any shape or form. I wanted to be a journalist. But I realised at the time, and we're talking um, now in, back into the 1980s, um, a lot of the stuff that was written about spies and espionage was just complete rubbish and you you knew it was complete rubbish and when I be, became aware of the National Archives and all these magical files yeah, that are queue, yeah. I realized there's far more in the public domain than that you know, which would tell you the truth um, behind the intelligence services than, than was appearing in the in, in the papers and um, that set me on the quest, I think, for writing a genuine book on So you, you weren't, when you were in the long watches of the night on shift, doing classy things for the Queen, you didn't conceive of the idea then? Did no, you? I didn't. I never, ever wanted to write a book about what I'd done in the services. And actually, in those days, I mean, we were in the middle of the Cold War, and it was very, very secretive. And yes. I think you would have been locked up if yeah, you, you tried would. to write. I'm sure you would. Talking of the greatest of the secrets, it, the world greatest World War II secret, or as far as we know, must be the ultra-secret breaking so many of the Axis codes, the German codes and so on at Bletchley Park. Now that is a wonderfully evocative story, and I've always thought it's partly because it plays to the way we Brits see ourselves, that we're a 59th minute of the 11th hour nation, and when we're really up against it, we get clever people, put them in a Nissan hut, uh, a Nissan hut surrounding a wonderful old stately home in the home counties, and we beat them. We yeah. knock shit out of them, Mick. And it's, it's an enduring feeling we have about ourselves, isn't it? I think it's an amazing thing, actually, Bletchley Park. You know, and I'm a trustee there now. And um, what they managed to do so very quickly, I, when they turned up at Bletchley Park at the start of the war in September 1939, there were around 100 of, or so of them, of whom only four or five had been working on German codes and ciphers, because everyone had assumed you wouldn't be able to break them. And they hadn't at this stage, of course, broken Enigma. Um, and really it was Dilly Knox and a couple of people working with him, one of whom by then was Alan Turing, um, who, who believed that Enigma could be broken. Yeah. Amazing, amazing we would have, achievement. We could well have lost the war without that, couldn't we? Certainly we would have lost the Battle of the Atlantic, which could have been curtains, some people think. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there are other, other areas, of course, the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, there was it made a crucial impact there. Battle of the Atlantic, as you say, North Africa, it was mm. very, very important in North Africa. Um, and D-Day as well. I mean, I think um, one of the untold stories in some ways is the breaking of the German Secret Service enigma Up by Dilly Knox. Yes. And without that, they wouldn't have known that the Germans had brought the D had bought the D-Day deception. deception. You couldn't have gone ahead with any short, you know, security. Without that. Quick word on MI6, the, 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 most, the most sparkling brand that Brit, the Brits produced <coughs> apart from the Queen, some would say. Quite tough writing about MI6. Very briefly, what's the, what's the skill you've got to bring to that? Well, I think you've got to be dispassionate, as dispassionate about, as you would be about any other subject. Um, and I think you have to be careful not to get carried away with this James Bond hype. On the other hand, they always say we're not like James Bond, but some of those stories from the Second World War and certainly some of the stories from the Russian Revolution and the uh, very early part of that first Cold War, um, there really are. Uh, they're Ian Fleming couldn't have even made those up. I mean, they were brilliant stories. It's real swash and buckle, isn't it? Yeah. 
But isn't, it, isn't intelligence work 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably true. And we were talking about Enigma. I mean, a lot of what you're doing when you're breaking codes is guesswork. Exactly. It's like reading, you know, widely said. In fact, they use the Daily Telegraph crossword puzzle to recruit people. Very last question, time flies when? Time flies when you're sat in the National Archives peeling through these documents, looking for these massive secrets that suddenly appear out of nowhere like a needle in a haystack. Spot on. Thank you. Right.